The Sports Spectrum Podcast is sponsored by Compassion International. We are so excited about partnering with this ministry. Compassion, through sponsorships like yours and mine, are releasing children from poverty in Jesus' name. Over 1.8 million children in 25 countries have been affected by Compassion International. It works. It's $38 a month. You will never regret it. Trust me on this. We're doing it. My wife, my daughter, myself, we sponsor a child from Haiti, $38 a month, and I never once have regretted sponsoring this child. And Compassion is the most trusted child development ministry in the world. And here's the big thing. Every child sponsored through Compassion is being discipled in the Word of God and over 150,000 children chose to follow Jesus Christ in the last year alone. So what is sponsorship? Well, your sponsorship opens the door to a church-based program run by caring Christian adults. For $38 a month, your sponsorship for $38 a month, your sponsored child will receive education and tutoring, medical care and food that they need, vocational training as they get older, and then of course, the big one, the opportunity to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Go to Compassion.com, $38 a month, and sponsor a child in Jesus' name today. Today's guest on the program is Jerry Schimmel. He is the radio voice of the Colorado Rockies, but he's way more than just a broadcaster. This guy has lived an extravagant life. Uh, an incredible life in a lot of ways. He's part of a new film coming out called Godspeed, The Race Across America, which tells the story of the seven-day racing journey that he participated in with his partner Brad Cooper across America a few years ago. And it's it's sort of told in a documentary form. And I watched it. I saw a screening of it. It is fantastic. It really is. It's one of those movies that capture the essence of just the grind and the elements playing a part in this race. I mean, he's literally on a bike racing across America in some of the worst weather conditions you could ever imagine being a part of. Fascinating to watch. So check it out. Godspeed releasing Tuesday, May 22nd, 7 p.m. local time. Go to fathomevents.com for more information. And Jerry joins us to talk about that film. We also talk about I mean, this is maybe the most incredible story. I know I say this a lot on the podcast, the most incredible story you've ever heard, but it just appears like each one of these are the most incredible stories I've ever heard. This guy survived a plane crash in 1989 that he probably shouldn't have survived. And we go deep into that story and hear the story of what it was like for Jerry to survive United Airlines Flight 232 back in 1989. So we talk about the crash. We also talk about his faith. Uh, he did not have a faith in God when this plane crash took place. And so how did that faith come about for Jerry as he was close to 30 years old and trying to figure out what the rest of his life looked like after he survived this plane crash? So we talk about that. We also talk about his broadcasting career. He spent 20 years as a broadcaster in the NBA with the Timberwolves and the Nuggets. And now he's in baseball, calling games for the Colorado Rockies. And we, we dive into the broadcasting world a little bit. I like talking shop with other broadcasters, of course, being a former broadcaster at ESPN myself. And it's really a, a fun story that he tells about the most memorable game he's ever broadcasted, both in the NBA and in Major League Baseball. The man's also ran nine triathlons, or I should say the man is also... The man's also competed in nine triathlons and three marathons, so... An incredible guy, an incredible life. Let's get right to it and hear the story of Colorado Rockies radio voice. Here's our interview with Jerry Schimmel on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Pleasure to welcome Jerry to the show. Jerry, welcome. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, it's great to talk to you. And I mean, listen, we could spend this you know, this time together, maybe even a full hour on just your broadcasting career because of all the cool things that you've gotten to do. And we'll be sure to talk a little bit about baseball and broadcasting as well. But you, to me, my friend, have lived a fantastic life. And <laughs> a former triathlete, you survived a plane crash. You're, you're of course, obviously a broadcaster with the Rockies. And now you're a part of this new film, Godspeed, The Race Across America. So let's start there. Tell us about Godspeed and, and being a part of that film. 
Yeah, in 2015, so three summers ago, a, a buddy and I did the Race Across America Ram, which is a pretty epic event. It's been going on for, I think this is the 37th year or something of Ram. Started with just a couple athletes, now it's hundreds and relay teams and all that. But something I wanted to do, Jason, for a long time, and I never really pulled the trigger on it. About the time I got the Rockies job, I was ready to do it, and then the baseball season hit, and I thought I couldn't train, and mm-hmm. finally decided that I was just gonna just gonna do it. Uh, I, I might not be in tip top shape because of my schedule, but I was gonna do it. And we uh, we invited a buddy along just to to document some things. And it's, it's, he was a video guy that had done TV commercials, just a friend of ours. Uh, Brad Cooper is is my partner in the relay race, and uh, we invited this guy along. He said, "Yeah, I'll come along. I'll take some. I'll take take some pictures and some video, and we'll see what we got." Ended up with 550 hours <laughs> worth of video <laughs> when he got back and spent literally a month just logging the the video and start working on this thing, and decided he had a film. So uh, he put this film together, and he had uh, he had rented a drone and got some really cool shots. And I thought just did a, a great job of, of catching the spirit of two guys trying to race across America in seven days on their bicycles and all the obstacles that we, that we encountered along the way. And, and, uh, and I think uh, got a nice taste of our Christian faith in, in the middle of the film. And, and uh, he put it together and entered some contests and won some awards and film festivals. And here we are in the big screen coming up on May 22nd. I got to see a screening of the movie, and I was amazed at the drive and the will that you and Brad had to accomplish this. I, I mean, I, I just, I, I really was amazed because there were so many shots and scenes of you inside a car, just trying to like rest or, or get your, 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 you know, get your your breath back. I guess in some ways. Tell me how difficult this was for you. Well, it was it was challenging. There's no getting around it. I think it was probably a little more so i mean we anticipate a lot of the stuff that we had to go through but a little more so with the weather than we thought uh the first day and and i, th- I think that's one of the the shots you're you're referencing first day was 118 degrees literally in the mojave desert in california and it was the hottest day i think they had there in 21 years on that date or something like that oh. and just it was an oven and just to get out of out of that and sit in a car and just try to catch your breath for a few minutes took took some effort so it was uh it was the, the weather there, uh, mechanical problems with the bike. I had stomach issues, uh, lack of sleep. I knew was going to be an issue, and it was big time. Uh, and then it just never stopped raining, Jason. The last three days, if you've seen the film, you know this. It just it yeah. started raining in Illinois and in Indiana, and it never stopped. We just we rode through a literally through a thunder, thunderstorm for three days, and and finally about an hour or two before the, the end of the race, the sun came out and let us finish that way. But it was uh, it, it was it was not easy, and we knew it wouldn't be easy, but it was probably a little more difficult than we anticipated. I got to admit, as I'm watching it, I'm thinking, why in the world would you subject yourself to this agony? Mm-hmm. And that's just my brain, you know, working. <laughs> I'm like, you know, just seeing some of the pain that you guys were in and some of the struggle. What was the hardest part about trying to do this? I think the hardest, the hardest thing for me was trying to keep the cigarette lid on the downhills. I mean, going uphill, you can smoke a cigarette. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> no, I, I think that the biggest thing for me was this lack of sleep. And I knew it was going to be that factor. I thought I could fight through it. And we decided that during the day, we were going to do an hour on, hour off. But at night, we'd give the other guy a chance to sleep a little more, do three to four hours. And that three to four hours in the middle of the night, which which I don't know why I signed up for, for midnight to four, but I did. <laughs> I couldn't stay awake a couple times. And I was literally falling asleep on my bicycle. And that was not only the toughest part, but probably the most dangerous part. So I think that was it. You know, during the day, you can... You, you will yourself to get out of the the car and and into the rain and and ride for an hour but at night when you're doing it when you can't see where you're going and it's driving rain and windy and mountains it's a challenge what's uh what's the goal here in in your mind to have this story you know be seen by a lot of people be heard on this podcast to be going to the movies and see it what what would you hope for that people would take away yeah i think there's a couple things uh one is that we all have a dream or passion or idea that's stirring inside us that I hope after seeing this film, people will act on that. Not, not Ram necessarily, nothing that drastic or, or that, uh, 
that much effort needed, but everybody's got a dream and something they've never done before they want to challenge yourself with. Hopefully we can, with this film, help people take that first step in that direction. You know, get out of bed or turn the TV off and get out of that chair, whatever that might be, to go to go try to conquer that dream. And secondly is, I think with our Christian faith, we wanted people to understand that when Jesus gets involved, cr- crazy and great things happen. So uh, that's what we... That's what we look at, at Ram is we got this, somehow we got this inner strength that, that comes from our relationship with Christ that we hopefully displayed in that film. The movie is in theaters for one night only, Tuesday, May 22nd, 7 p.m. local time. Go to fathomevents.com for more information. The movie is called Godspeed, The Race Across America. And our guest is Jerry Schimmel, and he's one of the voices of the Colorado Rockies in the Major League Baseball world. And, and this movie is going to be a lot of a lot of fun, I think, for a lot of people to see it. I hope they check it out. Go to fathomevents.com. Now, Jerry, we talked about your your life and just the fantastic and kind of crazy whirlwind it's been. Let's go back to 1989. I don't think a lot of people, some people maybe remember this story. I did not. So it, it was kind of a reminder for me. I'm 40 years old. So going back and remembering this, I did not remember this. So I want you to take our audience through 1989, and and you wrote a book called Chosen to Live, and it was about your survival of the United Airlines Flight 232. Let's go back to that moment and tell us how that all happened. Yeah. Well, first of all, for you not remembering, and I understand you're, what, 13, 12, 13 years old, so I probably (laughs) wouldn't have remembered that either at that age. But yeah, July 19, 1989 was the day of the crash, United Airlines Flight 232 in, in Sioux City, Iowa. And I was on the, the plane with my, my colleague, my boss. I was working back then for the Continental Basketball Association, which is the NBA's minor league system back then. And, oh, yeah. and uh, on a flight from Denver to Chicago, uh, about a two-hour flight from, from Denver to Chicago, we blew an engine, number two engine in the DC-10, crippled the aircraft, and they tried to make an emergency landing in Sioux City, Iowa. And just uh, no control of the plane because the explosion had, had eliminated the hydraulic system and several other controls, and they couldn't slow the plane down. A normal DC-10 landing is about 120, 25 miles an hour or so when you touch the ground. We hit it 255 miles an hour because they couldn't slow the plane down, and mm-hmm. that's just going to spell disaster. Came in and hit it at a 19-degree angle and uh, hit down hard, uh, slid about 1,200 feet, and then the plane flipped over, kind of cartwheeled forward, and and broke into to several big pieces and uh, ended up with 296 people on, on board, 112 died. Mm. So almost, you know, close to two thirds of us were able to survive that crash. And I know if you, if you Google it and, and you see the videotape of the crash, you wonder how anybody could have come out alive, which is the way I have looked at it, Jason, for, you know, three, 400 times since that crash. I, I still I'm just amazed that we, so many of us survived anyway. It was 30 years ago. What's the most m- vivid memory you still have of that crash? Because I think that's every person's nightmare in, in many yeah. ways, you know, and so many people fly every single day. What's the most m- vivid memory of that? You know, the, the one that always kind of sticks with me, I still have in dreams, is uh, we, we finally came to a halt. We, we, like I said, slid, flipped over, and, and then uh, from the piece that I was in, slid almost a mile. So we were start to finish from the touchdown until we came to a stop a little over a mile in into a cornfield. Mm-hmm. And I remember, remember when we came to a stop, and I was hanging upside down in my chair, and uh, I, I got unbuckled and dropped down the ceiling because we're upside down. And that's that view right there, that that sight of looking around the inside of the cabin and seeing no way to get out. I mean, the emergency exit was right by where I was sitting. It was gone. Uh, there were people hanging in their chairs or people thrown from their chairs. And I thought uh, at that image, I'm thinking, man, this this is really serious. This this is this is death here. And there's a lot of people that, that haven't made it. And now that I survived the crash. How am I going to get out? Because it was filling with smoke so very quickly. And I think that that first image of standing on the ceiling of the plane inside my little piece of the cabin is probably the one that sticks with me the most. Jerry Schimmel, the radio voice of the Colorado Rockies, joins us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast, brought to you by Compassion International. Sponsor a child for just $38 a day. Give that hope, give that chance, give that future to a child in need. $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com and sponsor a child today. Describe what what it, what 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 it was like after, and I don't mean after like getting off the plane. I just mean like the second you guys crash and you, you know, you realize you're standing upside down there. You paint such a vivid picture there. 
and what it looks like inside that plane or maybe you don't even have that memory but what yeah. can you describe that yeah i, I can yeah it, the piece of the plane that i was in was this pretty small section it was rows about uh it's for 37 rows in dc 10 i was in 23 so it's like 20 20 to 29 so like, only like 10 rows is is all the that ended up where we were. So the front of the plane had broken off from us and the, the tail section broken off from us. But I couldn't see anything forward because of the smoke and I couldn't see anything backwards. So I'm thinking I'm still on the, in the side of this big plane and didn't realize that we had broken off from the rest of the aircraft. That that was a, that was a um, it was strange because I remember looking up at the ceiling and seeing all these chairs that were just folded to the ceiling the, the actually the floor because they're upside down and they're folded to the floor and thinking to myself where are the people that were sitting in those chairs where are they mm. well they ended up getting thrown out of their chairs or their chairs had given and they were thrown in their chairs and i couldn't find anybody and uh, there was a little boy sitting in his mom's uh, lap in front of me i wrote about this in the book that i that i wrote uh, uh, called chosen to live and i wrote about this and there was a little boy there and i thought my first priority is to to find him we came to a halt when I went to his chair it was folded up like the others and he and his mom weren't in it man did you have a faith in Christ at this time no I didn't I, I, I was I, as far as you could get from a Christian at that point yeah so well, I want to talk about that in a second but I'm just curious you know when people are are standing in the face of death I guess and tragedy is is about to come a lot of people are are, are just naturally looking to pray you know, they don't know what they're praying to necessarily or who they're praying to. Was there anything like that for you in that moment or was yeah. there not really anything? There? Well, th there wasn't in that moment, Jason, but there was before that, before we hit. Uh, we had an unusual circumstance in that we had time to get ready for a crash. But from the time of the explosion until we touched down was 45 minutes because they kept uh, getting on course the, for the uh, airport and the plane on its own to veer off to the right because they couldn't control the direction of it. So we had to go back and line up. I think we did that five times. Mm. And so in that interim, those 45 minutes, we practiced the emergency landing procedures and the brace position, all that. So we knew what was going on and, and what we were getting ready for. We were told we were going to crash land. And in that time is when the prayers came. And you're exactly right. I, I prayed to some kind of being. I didn't really know what it was, but um, I was I was completely convinced I wasn't going to make it. I just kept thinking, people don't survive plane crashes, and yeah. I'm going to die, and I've got life insurance, so my wife will be okay for a while. And and uh, I didn't you know really know who I was praying to, but I was praying that when I'm gone, that my wife would be able to to carry on okay i knew i knew that she'd never find a guy as cool as me but hopefully you know she finds somebody close <laughs> right exactly that's always got to be part of the prayer right <laughs> that's right <laughs> was it was it chaos in that 45 minutes that you're in there or was everybody kind of pretty calm because i would imagine just yeah. being on a plane i've flown a lot obviously i i would think that there would probably be a mixture of both I would say uh, I describe it as a controlled panic. I mean, mm. there were a lot of people that were really. I mean, no one was 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 getting crazy, but it was when the explosion first happened. There was a lot of panic because uh, the, the explosion hit and we dropped. We started dropping out of the sky basically, and then came out of that drop. And once that happened, we leveled off somewhat again. Some of that chaos kind of went away, but uh, there was a. It was the middle of summer. A lot of families. A lot of young young people and then the rest of us were business and like like me and we just kind of kept ourselves there was a lot of praying there wasn't any a lot of outward panic but you could hear people crying and mm. and uh I, I think probably handled everybody handled as best we could the people that survived um and maybe even the families of the people that didn't was there any kind of connection there did you guys stay in yeah. touch much or was it more of a you know we made it out and then everybody just kind of went on their own no, it was, um, and that's interesting you say that, uh, families of people who, who passed away, people don't usually think of that, but that was a bond too, unusually uh, and surprisingly to me. But yeah, the answer to your question is after the crash, um, survivors, we felt a, a, a bond and we wanted to be together and we actually met uh, on a monthly basis, a group of probably 25 or 30 people in Denver. 
survivors of, of the crash and people, families of people who died just kind of met on a very informal basis, on a monthly basis for the first year. And then we started doing it about twice a year and the numbers dissipated, which is all healthy. I mean, we needed to do that for a while, but we needed to get past it as well. And, and those numbers dwindled. And now today there's a group of probably 15 or 16 people, family members of people who died and people who survived the crash. And we just become good friends with because of this this common disaster and do stuff socially with. So uh, it was a it was a big, a large bond for, and group of people for a while. Now it's a small, pretty close knit group. Tell me how quickly you were able to get back on a plane mm-hmm. and fly again because you're a business yeah. guy. You're working, I think yeah. you said for the CBA at the time, and right. um, obviously in broadcasting for many years and sports for many years. Uh, how quickly were you able to, you know, the aftermath of the shock of it, be able to get back on a plane? Yeah, it, this, this is going to sound a little more courageous than it really was, but <laughs> <laughs> I got back on a plane the next day, uh, really almost 24 hours to the minute after the crash. Crash happened at four o'clock Central Time and. Four mm-hmm. o'clock the next afternoon, United had brought another plane in and offered to take anybody back to Denver that wanted to go. And And I remember, and I hadn't slept all night. I, I was up looking for Jay uh, Ramsdale, my boss, the commissioner of the C- CBA who had actually died in the crash. And mm-hmm. I went to the hospitals to look for him and couldn't find him and figured he was uh, a casualty. So I decided to take this plane back to Denver. And I, I hadn't slept at all. So I got on that plane and I found a seat and, and fell asleep and, and uh, woke up. Up and we landed in Denver. I mean, I had no adrenaline left, nothing. I had no energy. Hmm. I fell asleep and and slept for two, for an hour and a half back to Denver, which probably was the best way it could have happened. You know, I'd, rather than have all this anxiety and thinking about it, I just fell asleep and woke up when we landed, and that's probably the the best way to get back on the horse, just to get back in that saddle and and fall asleep and not worry about it. So I realize I didn't ask you this. You obviously didn't suffer too many injuries if you were able to get out on a plane the next day. Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think I did anyway. And uh, I went to hospital. Everybody's going to go to the hospital no matter what. And I got checked out. I didn't feel any pain, nothing. And when I got, and even the next the next morning, I was okay. Second day, third day, I should say, woke up and could hardly walk. I mean, I had, my back was just wrenched up so terribly, mm-hmm. but I didn't feel that pain for a couple of days, strangely. And uh, it turned out I had a severe whiplash diagnosis. I hurt my lower back as well. I had a bruise all the way across my abdomen where my seatbelt restrained me. And I had a concussion. So, and I had smoking inhalation. So I had I had a lot of minor things that I got past pretty quickly. The only thing that ever really bothers me now is my lower back a little bit, but it's not too bad these days. Do you think about that crash every day? And especially being a broadcaster, yeah. you're, you're in Miami yeah. right now as we tape this. And so you had to fly there, obviously. Do you think about it? <laughs> I do. Yeah. yeah. I don't know that there's been a day that's gone by that I haven't thought about it. Most of the time, it's, it's not difficult. It's just a fleeting thought. Oh, I was in that plane crash and Thank God I'm I'm still here and survived. Or other days it's kind of encompassing, kind of uh, it kind of grabs you a little bit. But yeah, I think I remember thinking to myself a year or two after the crash. Okay, if I can just go um, a week without thinking about it, this would be great. And then I haven't even gone a day yet, which, yeah. which is okay. It's that's probably healthy. Yeah, and in some ways, I mean, by writing a book, you're hoping to you know provide inspiration for others. Uh, yeah. I'm sure in that realm too. So tell me, mm-hmm. Jerry, about your faith. We talked about it, uh, you know, that you didn't have really a faith in Christ during this plane crash. I wonder if that affected your sort of search for God and search for Christ or where that came from. So tell us about that. Yeah, it, it was everything. It was the reason for my becoming Christian. The plane crash was uh, after the the crash. Uh, I went through the the post trauma stress disorder like everybody else did from the plane, and I remember going to a, a counselor. I didn't I didn't do it very often, but the one time I went, counselor said I had post trauma stress disorder, and I had never heard that term before. I'm like post trauma. Say that again. Let me write that down. I'm, I've never heard that. Now we hear about it all the time with military personnel. But he told me I was going to go through survivor's guilt and anger and depression and you know all the things that everybody was going to go through coming out of that crash, and especially me because. Every Everybody around me ends up dying, but um, I didn't believe that. I, I shrugged it off. I, I thought, you know, I've always done things on my own and fixed my own problems, and I'll do that. And I couldn't do this one. And and for uh, ten months, I really struggled. I, I did. I quit my job. My marriage has fallen apart. Um, I have six brothers.
and sisters. I wasn't even talking to them. And I was I was doing exactly what that counselor said I was going to do with, with post-trauma stress disorder. And came to a point, uh, and I wrote about this in my book, the 10-month anniversary of the crash, 10 months after the crash. I was 30 years old and, and sitting in a chair in this little apartment we had in Denver. And my wife was working. Thank God she had income coming in a little bit. And I'm just thinking to myself, I've been knocked down. And for the first time in my life, I cannot pick myself back up. Hmm. And I just said a simple prayer. I just asked God to come into my life and, and give me some kind of relief from the crash. Not not save my marriage or get a new job or come out of depression, but just give me something to hold on to now because I can't do this myself. And I did that, and I could feel not, not a physical sensation or an audible voice. But I, I could just feel God come into my life and tell me that it's difficult, but we can work through it, that I'm going to win all these battles because I had the right ally fighting the battle with me. And I, I told my wife about what had happened that day, and, and she was a Christian. She was a believer, and mm. she, she and I just kind of went along with that and kind of ignored it because I was in love with her and wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. And right. that meant going to church with her once in a while. I did that. It isn't amazing what love can do with a guy. It can make a guy go to church. That's that's amazing emotion right there. <laughs> yes, but, <sir. laughs> uh, she, she, but then I, I realized that if I wanted it, if I wanted to be like her and have my sins forgiven, my spot in heaven secured, I had another big decision to make to accept Christ as my Savior. And, and I did that a couple of weeks later. And when I look back on it now, Jason, I think it's this. I, and you asked me about the, the, the crash leading to this. I think this is what it was. It was God telling me, Jerry, finally, I finally got your attention. It took 30 years in a plane crash, mm. but I finally got your attention. And now that I do... I want to tell you about my son. And more importantly, I want you to spend the rest of your life telling other people about my son. Mm -hmm. I think that's why I went through that crash. Wow. So how do you go about doing that now? I mean, obviously, you have this testimony, this amazing story, you know, the movie Godspeed, uh, the race across America, another way to share your faith. How have you done that? Because you've had such a successful career in broadcasting yeah. that you're in this sports world as well. I think it's um, it's seizing every opportunity to do that is the answer. Uh, I, it's using the platform as a broadcaster, using the platform as a plane crash survivor and a race across America winner in a two man relay three years ago. Yeah. Using all those things in my life to to give God glory and, and and point people toward His Son. So every chance I get, I do that. Any chance I get to speak at a church or a Christian group or even a secular group and can tell the story, I do that. Doing like I'm, I'm doing now with you on a podcast, to telling that story and, and maybe having some influence on somebody, writing a book about it and um, all the other things that go along with that. So th that's it. It's sometimes I think, well, I'm spending a lot of time not telling people about Jesus when I'm doing this broadcast and maybe I should you know, go into the 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 ministry full time and I think every time I thought that God says no I'm going to use what you're doing as a broadcaster to to give me myself glory as well yeah I lived that myself at ESPN and then it was time you know I had somebody once tell me you're supposed to bloom where you're planted and yeah. I believe you know that you're doing yeah. that Jerry and when it's time to stop blooming and and move on to something yeah. else God will make that clear too now yeah. obviously you're known as being the radio voice of the Colorado Rockies 20 years broadcasting before that in the NBA with the Timberwolves and the Nuggets. Let's talk a little broadcasting shop for a moment. I worked, you know, like I said, at ESPN for a long time, and I'm always fascinated by preparation and sort of the unique way that each sport is called and broadcasted. You call baseball games for the Rockies now. What's the biggest difference in your eyes in preparing, say, for an NBA game versus a, a baseball game? Obviously, the difference is in the way the style and the game is going, but what's the difference as far as preparing it for you and calling a game? Yeah, with, with baseball, there's a, there's a lot more to it. There's there's a lot more that goes into it uh, in terms of stories and uh, anecdotes and conversations and background on players. Because as you know, there's in a baseball game one pitch and then twenty thirty seconds of nothing, and you got You got to fill that time in. We're in basketball, and especially the NBA, it's rapid fire. You're just following the ball and the score, and, and that's about all the time you have to, to do that. And, and you don't get much time for background on players and stories. And I talked to this guy at the batting cage or this guy at shoot around. There just isn't that time in the NBA. So the preparation in baseball is you better have a lot of stuff ready to go, either in front of you or in your head, to fill this time in. Now, sometimes the inning, like, you know, goes one, two, three, and you're 
you're done and you you go the next inning and sometimes it Rockies had a a nine run uh, inning the other day against them by mm-hmm. the Cubs and so you, you got to be ready for all that if it's a 45 minute inning half inning you, you need to be ready for that so the preparation is different there's just a lot more that goes into it than than there is in basketball both are enjoyable both are are unique in their own way and how you present them and your pace and your style and both are a lot of fun but uh, baseball probably a little more challenging in terms of preparation let's talk about memorable moments when you've broadcasted for so many years i'm sure there are moments games uh unique things that happen that stick out to you let's start with the nba and maybe one of their more memorable moments games things something that sticks out that that Mm -hmm. uh, from your time there the most memorable moment yeah, for, for me with the with the Nuggets, uh, most memorable time I did two years with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Just the first game was was fun because it was my dream to make the NBA, and I had worked at it and finally got the break. And the first game we did was in Charlotte, North Carolina, against the Hornets. So that was fun for me with the with the uh, the Nuggets. It was. In my second year, I did the the team, like you said, for 18 years. Second year, the Nuggets made the playoffs as the number eight seed and up to the number one seed, the Seattle Supersonics, with that team that had the best record in the NBA that year. I think they won 63 games or something like that. And the Nuggets upset them, beat them in game five. It was a five-game series in Seattle against all the odds. And Mm. my goal uh, laying on the floor with the, the ball above his head at the end and all that was just incredible. We gave I gave that team no shot of beating Seattle and they and they did it. That was that was a great memory for me. There was a couple of games that were I think it was 153 to 150 triple overtime win on the road in Phoenix one year that was fun. But that that first one that playoff win game five was was the best for me. With baseball. Um, I, I think there was a, the, the biggest moment for me was that, uh, there's, they've only been the postseason once since I've been doing the games, uh, and that was last year, and they got beaten the, the play-in game in Phoenix. But there was one where Carlos Gonzalez hit a walk-off home run, not to not only to win the game, but to complete the cycle that he hit that day. So 10th inning, walk-off, uh, hit for the cycle, win the game was, was probably the most exciting one. Yeah, I remember that going back to the basketball store. I remember that eight seed in the picture of Mutombo looking at the ball like, we did it, and laying yeah. on the floor. <laughs> yeah. I believe yeah. that's the first eight seed to ever beat a one seed, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly right. Uh-huh. And it was only it a sure five-game series then, but it's still correct. a magical moment. And, and yeah. I remember and how good was, Seattle it, was. Yeah, and we had gotten the first two games out in Seattle, gotten blown out. I mean, 20, 25 point games and then yeah. came back and two close games at home and then went back to Seattle and, and pulled that upset. Yeah, that's it's that's fun when you can be a part of something that nobody sees coming in many ways yep. or nobody gives a chance to. That's really cool. A couple exactly. more minutes here with Jerry Schimmel, the radio voice of the Colorado Rockies. Now, again, reading on your bio and I see that you've completed nine triathlons and three marathons. And that's insane to me again, because <laughs> I'm just excited when I can complete a 5K. So I yeah. see a mar- three marathons in a triathlon. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people know, including myself fully, what a triathlon is and what that entails. Can you kind of share that with our audience? Yeah, yeah. It's um, it's swim, bike, and run. So you, it, normally in that order, you, you swim a certain distance, bike a certain distance, and then you, 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 you run all side by side by side, one after the other. And it's a... Uh, it's difficult. It's fun because you'd have three different disciplines, and but it's difficult to prepare for that. I mean, you have to swim a lot, and you have to bike a lot, and run a lot, and it takes a, a tremendous amount of time. I guess that's why I like cycling because I can concentrate on, on one of those uh, and not have to worry about all three. But uh, to me, it's just it, it it's a great deal of fun. And the key to to being a good triathlete is to swim. I mean, some people look can't swim. I got a daughter who's, who, who's doing triathlons and she struggles through the swim so bad. And, and then she gets on the bike and she roars and then she's a great runner. So, uh, that's what it is. It's swim, bike and run and you do them in succession. And, uh, it's, it's a, it's a wonderful thing. I mean, it's, it's not that you're not completing your life if you don't do one, but if you're thinking about doing one, have that urge, man, I, I sure, I, I sure urge people to, to, to take a shot at it, to do a small one, do a sprint triathlon where you got a 300 yard swim and a, and a 10 mile bike ride and a two mile run. I mean, I still do those with my daughter. So, uh, but doing one is a, just a, a great accomplishment. It's a great feeling when you get done, certainly. 
Is there a lot of training involved to do? I feel, I feel like there would be. I mean, that's a lot. Yeah. Of, it's a lot of a lot of different things there that you got to get right. Yeah, exactly. And uh, you know, it just depends on on how serious you are about it. But yeah, you do. I mean, you, I think especially swimming, you gotta you gotta get yourself in some kind of swimming shape and be ready so you don't drown. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I did a triathlon last summer with our daughter Maggie and I didn't run at all. I didn't train. I have an artificial knee. I had a knee replacement several years ago and doctors say, don't run on that. You wear it out too quickly. So mm. I, I did the swim and the bike and trained for those and didn't train to run. And I got through the, the five K. Okay. But I was pretty sore for a while. Wow. That's, I just, again, these, the, everything you've done, it's just fascinating to me. I mean, you're biking across the country, you're running triathlons, you're surviving plane crashes, you're calling, <laughs> crazy upsets in the NBA and baseball games. <laughs> it's been a good life for you, Jerry Schimmel. Yeah, listen, yeah. I appreciate you joining us. This is the the last question we ask. It's a question we ask all of our guests here on the podcast. And uh, I just, from you, what everything that you've been through and where you are today in 2018, I wonder what God has been teaching you uh, in this season of life for you. What are you learning from the yeah. Lord? Yeah, I'm learning that, um, that, uh, life is an adventure and a challenge all the time, and you're going to hit ups and downs, and there's going to be peaks and valleys. And the 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 peaks God is teaching me is where I need to stop and give Him credit, and the valleys He's teaching me is where I need to stop and get help from Him. So uh, I, I think what He's saying to me is, yeah, you have all these great things, and you've been blessed so much in your life, baseball and the NBA and triathlons and plane crashes and books and all this stuff don't forget that when you're standing on the mountain you, you don't look away from me and that's what he's teaching me all the time because people say like, like you've said jason you this charmed life and that all these things you've done well I, i've been able to do those because he's given me strength in that valley and when i got to the peak i don't forget about him i don't turn away from him and every day he's teaching me that same thing i, I feel it every single day he is Jerry Schimmel, radio voice of the Colorado Rockies and a part of the new film Godspeed, releasing Tuesday, May 22nd, 7 p.m. local time. You can go to fathomevents.com, and we'll put all that information on our website, sportspectrum.com. But you can go to fathomevents.com for more information. Check it out. It's it's a fascinating look inside. What Just a, an incredible accomplishment, Jerry. And we just appreciate you joining us here on the podcast and wish you nothing but the best. Hey, thank you. I appreciate you having me on, Jason. Man, what a life. We do thank Jerry Schimmel, the radio voice of the Colorado Rockies, for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Man, I, I think I was shaking my head about 100 times interviewing this guy. I mean, he survived this incredible plane crash and he biked across the country he's got a documentary out about that he's you know been in nine triathlons and three marathons he's a broadcaster been traveling all over the country broadcasting the nba broadcasting major league baseball that is a full life and we didn't even talk about being married and having kids and all that i mean just a full life and we thank jerry schimmel for coming on the podcast and sharing his incredible journey and we also thank Compassion International for sponsoring this podcast. For $38 a month, you can go to Compassion.com and sponsor a child in the Lord. Every child is being discipled in the Word of God. Over 150,000 children have chosen to follow Jesus Christ in the last year alone because of Compassion International and the work that they're doing. And we're just so grateful and excited about partnering with them in ministry here through sponsors like yourself, through sponsors like me, and my wife and my daughter, who sponsor a young 13-year-old boy in Haiti, Compassion is releasing children from poverty. In Jesus' name, over 1.8 million children so far have been sponsored and have been affected by Compassion International. That's why I want to personally encourage you to sponsor with Compassion. You will never regret this $38 per month, the most trusted child development ministry in the world, Let's bring hope to a child in need. $38 a month. Go to Compassion.com and sponsor a child today. Thanks so much for joining us here on the podcast. You can find all of our content at SportsSpectrum.com and you can reach us on our Twitter page at Sports underscore Spectrum and of course Facebook and Instagram as well. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel and you can find a ton of content on there including all of our podcasts. But you can also go to iTunes and leave a review. That's actually what helps bring 
uh, more awareness to this podcast and it helps more people kind of find out what we're doing here with Sports Spectrum. Over 200,000 downloads of this podcast have taken place since we launched it in late March of 2016. So in 13 months, we've reached 200,000 people with stories of sports and faith. Let's do more. Let's reach more people. Let's get to 400,000. Let's get to 500,000. Let's keep going until the name of Jesus is heard through the ends of the earth. Thanks so much for joining us here on the podcast. I'm Jason Romano. This is the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great one.